Within 10 weeks, you can learn to draw. You have to see yourself differently. I am a CEO, a money generating machine. You have to promote it so many times. You're in business after 30 paintings. It's a fact. I think that's the foundational skills that people should have. Welcome back to another episode of the Light Movement Podcast, where we discuss how to become successful as an artist without selling your soul to the dark art elitist system. In this episode, we are going to be talking about how to turn your art into a successful business. So this is going to be a complete mindset shift and dare I say, identity shift for a lot of artists who are uh, watching or listening to this. So uh, stay tuned till the end. We have a ton of amazing things planned for this episode. And as always, like and subscribe to our channel and put on the notification bell so you get updates when we have new episodes that come out every single week on Friday. So the first thing that um, artists need to have in order to be able to turn their art into successful business is a mindset shift. So what does that look like? What is the, you know, traditional sort of stereotypical mindset that an artist has? And then what is the mindset that they should have in order to turn their art into successful business? I think as an artist who wants to be successful with their art, they have to see themselves as a business owner. So they have to change that identity and see themselves um, just start calling themselves a business owner. And in order to see change and to see results happen, you have to, it all starts with your mind. You have to see yourself differently. Like if you are wanting to be fit, you have to see yourself as a fit person Mm -hmm. And you can't see yourself like where you are today. You have to see yourself in the future. That's how you bring it into a reality. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think you're right. It is an identity shift. Mm -hmm. You're shifting from what the world sort of, how the world defines an artist into how you define yourself as an artist and how you feel uh, about it. So the world would say, um, they sort of paint artists as these kind of like desperate, groveling poor, insecure, uh, you know, or egotistical. Starving. Yeah. Flaky. And flaky. And if you're not careful, that's how you're going to begin to think about yourself. And you won't realize that your art has so much value and worth and how unique you are and how much the world does need your art. You have to shift into a whole different identity that you're an influencer, number one. Number two, you have more guts than anybody else out there because you're willing to put your passion in and devote yourself to it and be disciplined and do it every day. You know, other people go to work click their time card, you know, go home and watch TV. You're not doing that. So you're already, you know, pretty set apart and pretty extraordinary. And yeah, you are a business owner and you operate, you're the CEO of a multi-international business. You can sell your art all over the world. You can't fill a cavity all over the world, but you can sell your art all over the world. Mm -hmm. So you have a business model that pretty much can't beat anybody else's business model because you can take a few things from raw materials and with your imagination and skill crafted into something magnificent that makes people cry. You should be paid well for that. And you should think of yourself as powerful business owner that can do something pretty amazing for the world and even shift culture. So it's a major identity shift. And I always say that there's a reason why the world has categorized artists as these lowly, pathetic souls versus, you know, and think about all the famous, um, you know, movies about Van Gogh. Like he was deranged and crazy and he cut off his ear and, Mm -hmm. you know, or, um, and, and just think about all the famous artists that are out there like Salvador Dali or, or, you know, Picasso or whatever. They're not great people you know, that, that are admirable, you know, as a celebrity. So anyway, I think the identity shift is, is pretty profound. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is there's been like this intentional sort of attack on the artist identity by this like elitist structure or system in order to lower the status of the artists within culture because art is powerful, right? Yeah. And wherever creativity is thriving, you have freedom. And the elite system can't control something that is free. Mm -hmm. So that's why artists are a deep threat to an elitist system of control. 
Yeah, it makes so perfect sense. the best way to keep them at bay is to redefine them as pathetic weaklings. Yeah. So in shifting your identity, not just as an artist, but as a business owner too, and really not shifting your identity from an artist to a business owner, but sort of rewiring what the identity of the artist means to you and like telling yourself as an artist, I am a business owner. I am a CEO. I am a successful person. I am consistent. I am dedicated. I am motivated. I am a money generating machine. Yeah. I, I am, think you can speak to that a yeah. lot because you sort of thought of yourself as, you know, I'm so young, who's going to listen to me? And mm -hmm. what did you do to overcome that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm on the spot. <laughs> I think I had the confidence over time. I gained confidence over time by participating in art shows, putting my work out there, seeing that people really want it and love it, and hearing their stories of how my art affected them. That gave me so much confidence. And just seeing, I mean, the money coming in, that felt like, okay, I can take this serious. And and then it I did take it serious and I wanted to, I did see myself, I feel like my identity did shift into feeling like a business owner. And especially when I, before that point, I didn't have a website. I wasn't really in control of my website and how my, you know, brand looked to people. Mm. So having my own website and being able to really be in control of that and all the products I was putting out there, it felt, that was kind of the first step that made me feel like, this is a real business. Like I have a store that people can come and buy stuff. And, um, so what you're saying is basically like the momentum that you get, like it's sometimes it's, you know, the question of the chicken and the egg. Sometimes you think, oh, I need to have this identity before I start. But sort of what you're saying is you going through mm -hmm. the motions and getting on Just that progress. Action. Yeah. Getting on that path, doing the action itself is sort of what helped you create that identity or reform that identity for yourself. Yeah, that's Definitely. good. Yeah. And I think the reason why we brought it up first is because identity is super, and you know, in Atomic Habits, uh, James Clear's book, it's the number one thing that he says that successful people do is they have an identity shift. They tell themselves what is, uh, you know, what is the lifestyle that a CEO lives? And then they model that lifestyle. What is the lifestyle that a business owner lives? And then they 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 identify themselves as that. And then they're able to shift all their actions and, and their habits into alignment with the pattern of behavior that would that, that person would fall Definitely. into. And I think artists have this default to like a lot of artists, I think they when they're starting out, they make these emotional decisions based on if they're feeling inspired in the moment, like if they want to paint that day mm. or they don't know what to do, they don't know what direction to take their business. They but need discipline. Yeah. I think they can just start modeling, like looking at successful people and think what would a successful lifestyle look like? Mm -hmm. And you have to have a routine. You have to have a schedule and set goals and also see yourself as a prolific artist. That's like the number one thing. If you want to be successful, you have to paint a lot. And every week devote your time and like... Hold um, on, that's step number four, though. You're getting ahead of us. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was going to say that relates to what you both are saying is that I've been hearing a lot lately about imposter syndrome. And mm. people are like, oh, yeah, I totally struggle with that. I have imposter syndrome. And... It's an excuse. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I was asking somebody recently, like, okay, tell me what imposter syndrome really is exactly. And so I was like, oh... I've totally had that. That's fake it till you make it. But that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You you have to assume the role in order to legitimately be in the role. And I think that maybe what imposter syndrome is, is when you assume the role, but then you don't, because of a lack of discipline, do the work that's mm -hmm. associated with that role. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that could then, be a reason. Then yeah. it really could be imposter syndrome because you're you're just in a perpetual state of pretending the real yeah the real imposter syndrome is when you tell people you're an artist but you don't actually paint <laughs> right right but the key is not or the answer to that isn't to fake it till you make it you you have to step into those roles you have to tell yourself you're a multi-international you know ceo of your 
own business that's shifting culture right now, Mm -hmm. even though maybe you've never sold a painting and your website's just getting started, it doesn't matter. You, You step into that role, you assume the role, and then as you choose your fonts, as you start putting, you know, your first artwork and their pieces up and you begin to write about it, you're in that mind, you know, frame of... I'm writing for a worldwide audience, a worldwide audience that's looking at my art and they want to buy it. And, and so you, you're creating your website for that role. But if you never even make a website, you never even sign up for, you know, Shopify or Squarespace or whatever you use, and you, you don't even do those steps and you don't do the writing and you don't sit down at your computer and it's just this website that's out there somewhere someday, mm-hmm. someday I'll make a website you know, oh, I'm not techie someday. Well, yeah, then, you you know, you can't assume that role. Don't assume the role unless you're willing to do the work. Yeah, that's a really good point. Every company has a startup beginning. Like you have to start somewhere. It's funny that with artists, they feel like it's just a whole different story, but it's the exact same as just starting a new company and opening up your business. And you learn as you go. You just have to start doing things. Like Mm -hmm. just do the action. So I would love to continue to dive into this topic, um, but we do have a lot more to cover. Um, So I want to make sure that we're able to cover everything. If you're, you know, I'm just going to take a quick pause. And if you're, you know, you, the artist that's viewing this, the business owner, the successful CEO, the, you know, disciplined human being that you are, if you are interested in this topic, leave a comment, let us know if you want us to turn this into uh, or dive deep into this topic and turn it into another podcast. We want ideas from you guys. We're trying to you know, make our jobs easier coming up with content ideas. So, (laughs) and we need your help. Uh, Okay. So I love that. So step one is the mindset shift, the identity shift into Mm -hmm. uh, a successful artist, a successful business owner. Um, So step two that I have written down, and if you guys have any other steps too, or if there are any steps before these that you think of, let me know, but um, is to get skills, get good. You got to get good if you want to get far. Uh, so yeah, uh, I agree with that. What is that? Yeah, do, first you guys agree with that, and second, what does that look like? Yeah, I think you definitely need skills. I don't think you have to have crazy, insane. There's, it's like um, there's two sides to the coin. Mm-hmm. There's people that are just like, I'm gonna get the website. I'm gonna dress real funky. I'm gonna do the talk. I'm gonna show up at the shows, and I'm an artist. And they're really like faking it till they make it. And they're not, they're not doing the important thing, which is um, to hone their craft and to really put time and effort into getting good. So, um, but then there's the other side where people feel like they have to go to school for 40 years and, you know, <laughs> They'll never be ready. Become, and yeah. they're never going to be ready. And they have to be a master of all masters mm-hmm. before they can ever even show anyone their art on You know, and I would say the world loves process. They love to see dedication, devotion, and authentic process. So if you are working at it, whatever level you're at, you can show your work and sell your work. Uh, We have students all the time that are just getting started and literally sell their very first oil painting that they do in the course. So people love process. They love to be a part of the journey. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, skills are really, really important. And I think you just have to be you know, very realistic and human and authentic about acquiring those skills and not realize that it requires, you know, talent necessarily to get those skills. Anybody can acquire those skills. So like, okay, I have a couple questions, but first what are, okay, you just said anyone can acquire those skills. I want to dive in a little bit deeper, zoom in on that a little bit more. So like, what about those people? Cause I mean, you've encountered them. The people who just really don't seem artistically inclined. Like if there's someone watching this and because I know I've met some people that you're like, okay, you think everyone can be an artist and then you meet (laughs) that person and you're like, well, maybe not everyone. (laughs) I personally believe it's a matter of learning how to use your right brain. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, Mm. those people are just really stuck in their left brain. And it will be harder for them to learn the skills, but eventually it might take, you know, a few more months than other people, but they'll, they'll definitely get it. It's just learning how to transition and go in and out of that space and the right brain, whatever you want to call it, like realm. Yeah. It's, (laughs) that's where all 
like the most beautiful art comes from. Mm. So, and I want to say too about those left brainers, the people that you meet and you're like, wow, if I ever knew a person that maybe couldn't do art, this, this is the person, right? That, that just like zero aptitude. In fact, they have anti-aptitude, you know, <laughs> negative, just aptitude. negative <laughs> and a replete, you know, they just don't have it. They still can learn yeah. if they have enough passion oh, and definitely. they want to. And the reason why they come across as somebody that isn't creative or doesn't have that flair is because they are locked into their left brain probably because they've always been told from a little kid that they weren't very creative and they were like really good at math or they were the organizers mm -hmm. or they were the they were the linear thinkers the natural born bookkeepers the natural born <laughs> bookkeepers whatever and so they assumed that identity mm -hmm. and they they That's lived so true. they lived in that their whole life and never explored or muscled up the and they, their right brain is literally atrophied and they have not um, exercised it at all because of identity that's one thing and then the other thing is uh, control and self doubt so if i've i've taught artists that have grown up with that identity and then they're always like, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I can't do that. I can't draw. I never have been able to draw. And I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. And they- and I can't even draw a fly. Yeah. And they, <laughs> and they have just already resigned themselves to forever and ever and ever till the end of time are going to be terrible at drawing, not creative because their second grade teacher told them there would be a great librarian or whatever. And they're just so locked into that. And, and it's safe. And- to move outside of that into never, never land or, you know, a, a completely different realm is terrifying to them. So those are the people that I think it's harder for and it, and it's interpersonal. It's very deep. It's very, and that's when you get people in your class crying um, because they can't paint a chicken, you know, or they think they can't paint a chicken. And and so it's very, very deep. And that I would just say- like a specific story. <laughs> no, actually, I, no, I mean, I've had this story yeah. many, many times. But anyway, I would say to people like that, to anybody listening who, you know, somewhere in there, there's this calling, there's this deep place calling to you saying, go create, go make an art. You know, wouldn't it be fun if you could do that too? And, and immediately it's shut down with, oh, I, I'm not creative. I'm a librarian. I'm an accountant like dive into it and just know it's going to be a radical, um, oh, just interpersonal soul shift and, and you're, you're going to be set free in so many ways in your life. And even if you don't ever sell a painting and you don't become a professional artist, just paint and create for just the sake of becoming like who you were designed to be. Because I believe all human beings on planet earth we're created by a creator and therefore are created to create. Mm -hmm. We all are creators, every single one of us. We have it in our DNA. It is, it is written on our heart. It is our destiny. Is it to have the profession as an artist? No, I think that takes passion. That takes dedication and a desire to want to do that. Yeah. But I think every art collector out there should paint. You know, I think every human being should paint. Every second grade teacher should paint. Every lawyer should paint. It will free them up. It will, it will muscle up their right brain. It will, it'll radically change their life for the better. Yeah. Imagine how much better the whole world would be <laughs> if uh, every person, at least at some point, actually painted and not just, you know, because they had to in seventh grade art class, but because they wanted to, or they had a positive experience with painting. Yeah. And they know? actually saw skills develop, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. So skills. So earlier you said that you don't think that people have to get, you know, this massive amount of skill in order to be successful or in order to turn their art into a su successful business. So what are some of the, you know, preliminary, the like basic essential skills. essential skills? Yeah. If I'm an artist and I'm watching this and I want to be successful or it turn my art into a business, what sort of skills should I have? I think every artist should know how to draw proportionately 
Well, drawing and painting, it's really the same. It's the exact same thing. Just having those foundational skills in oil painting Hold and on. drawing. Hold on. You just said drawing and painting are the exact same thing. Okay. I can, I guess I can some just people... sense in YouTube land or, you know, yeah, podcast yeah. land, people it's are like, confusing. well, I draw and I, because I hate painting or vice versa. How we teach drawing and painting is that you use the drawing tools as if they're painting tools and you're not sitting like, you know, at a desk with a pencil and it's very controlled. That's probably how a lot of people think of um, drawing. But so that's what I meant. That, mm -hmm. that could have been confusing. Yeah. I think that's the foundational skills that people should have is they should be able to paint and draw something realistically. And then from there, abstract it and turn it into something that's their unique perspective. Yeah. So I think that all sounds super daunting to somebody that's never done it. So <laughs> yeah. I can't draw a fly and now I have to learn how to draw and paint realistically. Mm, not for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, from Demetrius' perspective, it's it's way easier than people think. Literally, no joke, within 10 weeks, you can learn to draw. Well, and that's because you guys see it happen all I the time. I see it happen. Like, like I'm, I'm, Well, even sooner for some people. Even yeah. sooner for some people. But I'm saying if you don't have a lot of aptitude and you've never drawn in your life and you're like, I can't draw, within 10 weeks, you can learn to draw pretty fluently. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say within 16 weeks, you could draw pretty expertly. That's less than four months. Yeah. Some people go to art school for four years for that. <laughs> right. And then sim and what we mean by that is you would be able to size up anything and draw it in proportion and be able to draw what you see, mm -hmm. whether it's a figure, form, a plant, a chair, a building, anything, anything that your eye can see, both in life and a photo. Then I would say the next skill to develop. So we just told you a very specific skill and how long it should take to learn it. And then simultaneously in tandem, you can learn um, how to paint, which would involve color mixing, how to use different mediums and materials, um, how to load up a paintbrush. Do you put this much? Do you put that much? How to deliver a brush stroke, basically how to work those tools and how to, with your drawing skills you're learning, render form, basically paint light and shadow. Uh, so value, you already learned proportion and everything in drawing. Those are the those are like the general ideas of skills that you have to pick up. And I think also going with that is going to be color and color theory, which is pretty basic and simple. I mean, you can learn that literally in an afternoon. It's just a matter of applying it and remembering it and using that in coordination with, um, you know. So personally, I think about four months for both drawing and painting, um, you could learn both at a very high level enough to actually be able to begin to apply it towards your own self-expression. I think what I meant by painting and drawing realistically is is really just knowing proportions. Like when, when people see your work that things are in proportion. It doesn't have to be realistic. So if you wanted realism to be your style, that's something you could develop and work towards. But I didn't mean you got to start out like having photo those, realism. Yeah, no, yeah. just... No. Just proportions are very important. Yeah, proportions, value, color. Mm -hmm. and basic basic foundational skills. <clears throat> yeah, but I think most people think that this type of stuff takes... A degree. A degree or four years or this long, boring road of painting skeletons, you know, or drawing skeletons. And <laughs> and it doesn't, you know, you it, it doesn't take long to train your eye. And of course, the more time you spend on that and the more intensity you have just the more sub, sub, uh, submersive it is, you know, the, the quicker you'll learn. Simultaneously learning how to use your right brain. Yeah. And that's going to make learning all this so much easier. That's right. Yeah. And then, um, so these are all like the art skills and it's, you know, fantastic. It's definitely essentials. You know, you have to learn the oil painting, the drawing, you should learn mixed media, how to abstract, you know, the elements of art that you're talking about with, um, you know, the shading, the color, the proportions, composition, all that stuff. Um, and really, like you said, it doesn't take that long to get it. Like if you have the proper examples and you have the proper teaching, mm -hmm. then you can learn it at a super accelerated rate That's right. um, without all of the extra fluff and, you know, without spending, you know, four years. It certainly doesn't take that long. Well, what I've seen in art schools is number one is really dragged out. And then they teach you how to um, draw and paint with your left brain. And that's if they're academic. Then you have the other kinds of art schools that don't teach you anything. And they're like, 
yeah, so draw this, paint this still life. And, um, you know, I'm going to go outside and have a cigarette. You know, they, it's like <laughs> they, you just, or express yourself, paint, Feel your, way through paint it. your angst. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and then they spend 30 minutes talking about what angst is, you know, and Nietzsche. So that's one kind of art school. Then the other kind, is it is academic, but then there's all kinds of formulas. There's all kinds of like nitty gritty. Rigor. Rigor that, mm-hmm. that <clears throat> sort of gets you captivated in this left brain mentality of calculating and, and you're all you're thinking about, if you are really truly learning art, you're not thinking, you're just, you're just doing, and it's a, it's a communication between your eye and your hand Mm -hmm. with no words, a communication between your eye and your hand with no words. That is true art education. Um, yeah, that right there, you could become an artist if you just took that statement and ran with it. (laughs) Yeah, because most art schools, it's it's this formula, this handout, this 30% of this paint. This is a tint. This is a shade. Okay, here's a pop quiz. Is this a tint or a shade? You know, it's like, who cares? It's it's like, my eye can see what that is. I don't even know what to call it. I don't know what words to put to it. But I know my eye knows what it is. My eye knows, you know, and communicated here. And then it came out here and I did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so beautifully simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is complex though. Like there are definitely a ton of nuances and you can spend, you know, your whole life studying it and people do. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but if you want to turn it into a successful business, you don't have to get to that point before you start. You uh, could be in process there. I am. And I've been doing this for 20, whatever, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing this for six, seven years. 15th. So that's almost eight. Yeah. Eight. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. You're so young. You're almost on to a decade of being a professional. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. <laughs> and you're not even 24. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I'm still on the road. Yeah. You're still on the road. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm learning all the time. I actually oh, yeah. arrived just yesterday. Um, <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. The skills that we've talked about are all art skills, and there are some essential business skills in order for an artist to be a successful business person. Briefly, what sort of mindset, not just mindset, but skills that an artist yeah. should have as a business oh, person? Okay. Hmm. Because if you want to be a successful business person, you can't just make good art. The first thing that comes to mind is actually good writing skills mm, and being able to express yourself through words and really knowing like how to talk about your brand. I think that's so crucial um, in order to be successful. And that comes into play. Okay, I'm gonna challenge you on that one. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Do they, no, because somebody's listening right now. Decent writing skills. And I've met, and I've worked with these artists. Third grade level, actually, I would say. That have terrible writing skills. And in order to acquire good writing skills, they're gonna have to take a couple writing classes and practice. Yeah. No. (laughs) I'm challenging you. Okay. Not true. Doesn't it just require authentic writing? Yes. I would say, and please, for the love of God, just use Grammarly. Who's read The Color Purple? I I haven't. I mean, okay, granted, (laughs) you know, she wrote literature, but she wrote the entire book through, I forget, like like a 12-year-old, you know, uneducated voice. You know what I mean? Like like voice, it's all about voice. I I mean, being able to... Like you, I've read some artist bios and the way they talk about their branding. And it's like, that is so confusing. I don't know what you're saying. You mean clear. So what you're, so you're basically agreeing with her, but just using different terminology because you're saying you don't have to be this like master English professor. I, I, I agree with you, but I think you have to know how to express yourself in an authentic way. You can find somebody, a, a friend, a family member, anybody that's good at editing that can sift through your bio, anything that's third party, that's not your voice as the artist, that's like like a bio, like you said, so that they can spiff it up and make it make sense and be, you know, coherent and well-written. They, they can that's farm that I out. Mean. They can farm that out. They don't have to learn. Well, but they gotta be your titles, it, your blurbs, your tone, your voice, your Instagram, your, your social media, stories, your think. ability to tell stories, yeah. those kinds of things. I think all you have to do is be your natural true self and use the language that you speak in hmm. and and use those words. They can be very simple words. They can be uh, as long as there's voice, as long as there's voice to it. I agree with all that, but I just meant specifically for branding for your website 
for emails, you have to clearly communicate and know. I think that takes a little bit of skills in writing. But you yeah. have to just know if you have bad grammar. I mean, it's that's not going to work. I mean, so. it's but that's solved with Grammarly or, you know, some sort of yeah, or copy Google paste. Docs. I mean, you know, you can or getting easily, people to edit. Yeah. Or getting people to edit. But you can do that by yourself easily with, you know, the software nowadays. That's, you know, some of the benefits of AI is helping us improve our writing. <laughs> I'm just like, I, I'm even, I'm working with students that English isn't their first language uh -huh. and they're, they're, it's like, I read their bio and it's like, oh, uh, you can't put that out there. But to find an English speaker to edit it, it's so easy, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's not difficult at all. And you don't all, have so. to pay them. You can just exchange services too, yeah. you know. Okay. I'll maybe, do a portrait of you if you, you know. I agree with all that. Um, edit my but website. in the beginning, you'll have to get help. But as you are growing your email list, you're putting out newsletters, you're putting blogs, you're updating your paintings, you're talking more. I don't know. You're going to have to learn how to express yourself and tell stories and be like, it, it's, I'm not perfect. We're, none of us are like arrived. Like we're all getting better. But well, I think, I, I think I, I just think it so. is an important skill. That's all I'm saying. Okay, Dimitri, I totally agree with you. Writing is really, really important. And I think for an artist to be an entrepreneur and the CEO of their multinational business, uh, they they should definitely learn to write. Mm -hmm. But I think what's important to distinguish right now, you know, what is um, having a successful art business yeah. versus going all the way and, and having, you know, the top art business, the top <laughs> successful yeah, art we business. We could be talking about two different things. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a road, it's a journey. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about getting on the board. Like, I think, I think this podcast should maybe be mostly centered around like how to get on the board. And then we can pepper in and, and talk about like, okay, when you're further along in the journey, this is, this is some more skills. You're never going to stop growing. I'm still growing. You're still growing. I'm still acquiring skills. I'm still learning all kinds of things, both in the business side of things and in, in creating. So to get on the board, I think that, you know, to me, a successful, you know, art business is someone who, you know, acquires some skills put some time and devotion into creating some paintings, you know, puts together some sort of a website and social media platform, uh, launches out there, gets into some tent shows, um, shows and sells their work. As soon as they start selling work, which will happen pretty quickly, it'll happen on social media, it'll happen in these shows, it'll happen with maybe businesses that they collaborate with, they are going to get a taste of what it could be. And that is what is going to drive them and propel them to, you know, making instead of $1,000 a month or $1,500 a month or maybe even $2,000 a month to the point where they're going to be able to make, you know, six, seven, ten thousand $10,000 a month, $15,000 mm -hmm. a month and have a full-fledged thriving business where they're going to begin to hire a team to help them. Yeah. It's a growth process. Yeah. yeah. So to well, to just clarify, we're defining turning your art into a successful business as turning your art into a like $3,000 a month venture. Just getting started. Right? The, the sort of initial business launch phase. Because there are, you know, a million things in one that you could talk about in the whole business realm right. and in the yeah. art realm separately. And yeah, you combine yeah. them together. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. Well, but oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to finish with one thing on mm -hmm. um, the skills for, you know, business skills. I think um, you grow those business skills as you get started. You just have to start doing things. Like you said, going to shows, just showing up, getting your work out there. And something that's important, I think, is being able to talk with people about your work. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be really skilled at first, but once you start doing more of that and you have more experience, your confidence will grow. And it's kind of this natural, it's going to come very naturally. I think anyone can learn how to sell their work, talk about their work, just be vulnerable mm. and learn how to have good, meaningful conversations with collectors and really get them talking more than yourself talking. So mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah. good. Um, so basically most, mostly what you're talking about is communication. So how to communicate yeah. your art with others, mm -hmm. um, whether it's written or speaking or video, you know, social video, media, whatever. Yeah. Now, what I, what I wanted to say about business skills is, um, I kind of wanted to, you know, poke holes in the myth of a lot of people. I, I meet so many people and they tell me, 
that um, they're going to go to business school or they're going to take an accounting class or they're going to take a, you know, a small business class or something. And I don't think that's the way to go at all. Um, to this date, I've never once taken an accounting class yet. I did my own taxes for 20 something years for a full fledged business. You know, I don't, I don't think that accounting class and, and what we're talking about business is, is the way to go. I would convert all that time and money into investing in really good books. And, uh, I think business books and reading those, um, and, or listening to them while you're painting, you know, on audible is, is a great way to go. And I've learned a ton that way. You've mm -hmm. learned a ton that way. That's how I learned. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, there's a lot of fantastic business books out there and you almost can't go wrong. Just just start. And one book will kind of lead to another. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of communication, that uh, story worthy book that you you uh, showed us. Fantastic. That can teach anybody how to communicate a story and how to really touch an audience. And I think every artist should should read that book, honestly. Definitely. Yeah, I completely agree. Step number three that I have written down, and you know, as I said before, feel free to disagree. I know we're all opinionated, <laughs> is uh, to find your unfair advantage. And so I sort of got this phrase from this really good book that I just read. It's called The Unfair Advantage. And it's by two angel investors out of the UK talking about like they see hundreds and hundreds of startups come to them and they find the reasons why they fail. Um, and they, the, the typical most common reason and what they say is they take sort of a controversial approach against the idea that all it takes to succeed is hard work, which um, they're not saying it doesn't take hard work because it takes hard work, but also it takes hard work plus finding your unfair advantage is their whole premise of this book. And I love it because it's honestly true. Like if you have someone working super hard, chiseling uh, or, you know, chiseling away rocks, uh, then, and then, you know, you have the same person apply the same effort uh, that they would of physical effort using dynamite to blow away rocks. The Who do you think is going to build a mine faster? <laughs> the person with a pickaxe or the person with dynamite, right? So you have to find your unfair advantages um, in order to actually leverage your hard work and amplify and multiply it uh, in order to become successful faster. Uh, and so they have this framework that's really good that I like a lot. Uh, it's called miles. And that's, um, these are the different types of unfair advantages that people can have. Uh, and that's money, intelligence, location, education, and status. So all of us on this spectrum have some sort of uh, unfair advantage. And, you know, some people, you know, their unfair advantage is they were born into a rich family. And that's not a bad thing. Like so many people are like, oh, they're just a rich kid. Well, that's not bad. You can leverage your unfair advantage and yeah. life's not fair, it's, you know, at the like end the of the day. It's like the parable of the woman's, the widow's oil. Yeah. Well, basically like the, the parable is go into your house, see what you have in your house. That's your unfair advantage. Like mm. she had a ton of oil in her house. She just had tons of oil. So she bottled up the oil and that was her unfair advantage. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. And some people are born naturally smarter than other people. It's a fact. Like you can't just say that's not true because there are some people who are born really smart and some people who are not born super duper smart. But those, the intelligence doesn't just go with IQ. There's EQ. There's PQ, there is SQ, you know, uh, some would even say there's CQ, it's cultural quotient, <laughs> like your ability to understand culture, which probably just goes with your EQ anyways. But, you know, maybe that's part of your unfair advantage. Maybe it's your location. You're in this super poppin' art scene, you know, you're in the middle of downtown uh, Greenville or Asheville or um, Statham or, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> or wherever, you know, wherever you're located, maybe that's part of your unfair advantage. Or this is, and this is my personal favorite because everyone nowadays has unlimited access to this basically via the internet. It's education. Like every single person uh, can and should further their education. They can turn any sort of lack of education into an unfair advantage by taking the right course, by taking the right program, by, uh, you know, simply reading books or, um, you know, pursuing education. Not, not, I'm not talking about colleges or universities, but I'm talking like, you know, good old online art schools, good old, <laughs> you know, no, or, or YouTube even, or, you know, just books, any sort of 
um, education that you can get your hands on. Uh, if you vivaciously pursue it, then you will have such an unfair advantage over the people who just don't even try to learn anything new at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the last one is status. And, um, we're going to tie this into some of the concepts that, uh, you, you teach in the mastery program, Ellie, but, um, the last one is status and that's just, you know, your network or, um, a blue check mark on Instagram or, uh, you know, having a bunch of followers or, you know, that's, we all know what status is. So, uh, that's another unfair advantage that you can leverage. So finding your unfair advantage is part of the step. And then I would say what goes with that, and this is a progression too, right? Like you have your identity shift, you are gaining your skills, and then you find and combine that with your unfair advantage. And basically tying into that too, I want to add uh, another S to the end of this is your story. Because it's, you know, that's each of us have a, our own unique individual story. And that is a part of our unfair advantage because no one else has lived that. And so we can tie that into your art or into our art, into, you know, your communication that you're doing with the world, into everything and, and leverage that to create a more successful business by being authentic and vulnerable. And that's almost, man, it, it is mandatory to have a successful art business. So that was my rant. Um, thank you for listening to my TED talk of someone else's idea. I'm just adding on to it. Uh, <laughs> just well, kidding. I had but, a question. Yeah, go for it. You're saying... To find your unfair advantage, it's one of those things in the miles. It has to be one of those things. Um, or it can be outside that. That's just the framework that these two guys came up with for startups. And that doesn't, those are, it's startup is it's typically within the tech, you know, industry. And so it's not necessarily related to, well, it is related to art, but it's sort of a more niche thing. It's not for individuals. And that's why I would say like adding story to the end of that, a yeah. miles with two S's, uh, because story is just as an important component as all of these things. And really, I mean, a lot of these things kind of can make up your story too. You know, like maybe your story is that you were born dumb, but you got a really good uh, education by learning these different things and picking up these different skills. And you never thought that you were going to be able to paint. But uh, now, you know, the person who couldn't draw a fly is able to um, draw, you know, charcoal uh, still lifes from life in 30 minutes live in front of other people and sell them for thousands of dollars. Our uh, cameraman, content contributor, extraordinaire Tanner just said to put the S in the beginning and it's smiles. It's way better than miles yeah. with two S's. Okay. Thank you, Tanner. That's fantastic. So anyways, I think a part of finding your unfair advantage though, in terms of art, um, a, in addition to this is your voice and your process. You know, that's sort of your unfair advantage additionally as an artist. So I'd love to hear you guys talk a little bit more about like voice and process, um, and how that relates to turning your art into a successful business. Okay. So my thoughts on that are, you know, I think that the smiles works well in terms of communicating your art to, um, to the outside world and getting, getting business and getting, getting a market. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think that within art, um, every artist has an edge. And when we mean that, we, we're talking about their actual, you know, art itself. And I think that an artist has to not only find their edge in terms of business and communicating their, their visual art and their product, mm -hmm. you know, communicating their, their product to the outside. Um, but in making that product, you need an edge. Because if, you know, think about how much art that's out there. And if I just paint another pretty landscape, um, you know, or another red barn, like who, how does, how am I differentiated from anybody else? What makes my red barn special? And that, that you, I think every artist has to begin finding their edge. And I think that has to do, it goes kind of along with what the book was saying. And maybe your unique advantage is more like, you know, some unique characteristics about yourself, S some ways that make you different than anybody else. So I know for myself, the combination is, you know, my, my upbringing and my, my story, the fact that I, I grew up in a Greek house has definitely affected my artwork or, or <clears throat> colored. Um, so a lot of times it could be, you know, your cultural background, your upbringing, 
Um, you can also take disadvantages like, you know, hardships and difficulties uh, from your upbringing and flip them into, you know, a strength. Exactly. And uh, I know you've done that a ton. So a lot of times your, uh, your pain or your deficit in life becomes your strength. It becomes your platform. It becomes your, uh, you know, um, what do they call that? Your soapbox. And uh, I know that's been true for mine and uh, a lot of people I know. And almost any successful business owner you meet, um, like that story worthy um, book, the author of that, the reason he became such a fantastic storyteller is because he grew up in a household where he was never listened to and he was ignored and he was neglected. So he took a deficit in his life and he turned it into a disadvantage. His, yeah. Yeah. A disadvantage and turned it into his greatest strength mm -hmm. and his, um, you know, mandate in life. And then he's taught everybody else how to be heard and how to tell their story. It's beautiful. So I think every artist has that. And um, to identify that, you know, you, you have to take a glance and look at your pain and, you know, your deficits and what you've lacked. And instead of seeing those as um, a reason not to succeed, turn those around as the force, the driving force, that energy, that that mandate that really gives you the passion to succeed and the unique edge to succeed. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's like, so combining that, what you're saying, getting, getting your edge as an artist with your skills and your own unique process and combining that with some sort of unfair advantage that you might have that would help you in business, that would definitely set you, you up for success. You are already a million quadrillion miles ahead quadrillion. of most people. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I didn't take accounting. <laughs> <laughs> really, like even if you just take like one tenth of what we're saying in this podcast and apply it, I think you're already head and shoulders above everybody else. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's you know that's the thing is we're we're speaking from you know, years of experience, or at least you guys are speaking from years of experience. Um, and so it's, it doesn't take all of this to become successful or even get a little bit of success. You know, if you just, like you said, focus on like one aspect, if you literally didn't even focus on, if you just only focused on making the best art possible and you ignored everything else, uh, and then, you know, maybe contacted some galleries and stuff, you could certainly achieve success as an artist without even having to learn how to tell your own story or anything. Because if your art is that good, then the gallery is going to come up with the story and tell the clients the story themselves. Yeah. But that being said, like if everything- If you really want to kick butt. Yeah. If you really want to kick butt, then you get good at all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how you become unstoppable. Yeah. yeah. And you have your whole lifetime to get good, you mm -hmm. know, just get start good. somewhere. Yeah. So the next step is to develop your brand and assets. And by assets, I just mean like um, business cards. Yeah, your business cards, maybe your website, mm -hmm. um, if you're going to pursue that route of selling online, or it could even be something as simple as like artwork archive. And uh, your brand is communicating that edge. Mm hmm. So that's all branding is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just communicating the edge that you've already established in the previous step. So. Um, so branding done. Well, and, and, but on <laughs> assets though, some of the other assets that artists need in order to launch is obviously paintings. Like you need, oh, yeah. you Product. need artwork. So what is like sort of a baseline for what an artist should have in order to be launched into a business? Well, we always say you're, you're in business after 30 paintings. 30 paintings. 30 Why the number 30? Paintings. 30 available paintings. What? So to yeah. some people that might seem like a lot like a lot of work stacking up, but in reality, it's really not. Mm -hmm. If you were to be in five galleries, you would be like out Wiped of inventory. Out. Mm -hmm. And then what? It's If you do a show, you, that takes, you know, half of your inventory. Um, if you, whatever it is you do, you know, you're, you're going to need product. And usually per event, per venue, per outlet, you're going to need anywhere between you know, six to 15 pieces. So that's a, about an average of 10. So 30 paintings will give you three outlets, three venues, three occasions. And mm. out of 30 paintings, maybe five to 10 of them will sell really quickly right away because they're going to be better or they're going to hit someone at the right time in the right moment. And then the rest of them might take a few years. You never know when something will sell. That happens 
all the time. So Mm -hmm. you, the more inventory you have, it's like you have a better, a higher chance with more paintings that will sell immediately. So if you have more than 30, that's better. Mm -hmm. But do you think that someone in order to start their business needs to have 30 paintings or they could like start and then... I do. And the reason I say that is you could paint five paintings, go to a tent show and sell two of them and be happy, I suppose. But to me, you haven't proven yourself to even yourself in terms of dedication and commitment until you've painted 30 paintings. I know people that call themselves an artist and they've painted like three paintings in their whole life. So to me, to even get past that sort of, you know, imposter syndrome, that's real. Um, <laughs> not not the fake it till you make it one, but mm-hmm. the the like... You are a phony. <laughs> yeah, get to get past that so that you believe in yourself and you trust yourself and others will trust you and you actually have a product that not only you believe in, but that belief transfers to other people. It takes at least 30 paintings. Hmm. And I would say 30 paintings that are at a certain quality, not just your first 30 paintings. Mm-hmm. And if you're not able to paint, if that seems daunting to you and you're like, how in the world am I going to ever paint 30 paintings? Then you're not painting in the right process. You know, a painting sh- really shouldn't take you more than nine or 10 hours. You know, maybe maybe if it's really, really large and complex and very representational, up to 20 hours. But really, you should not be spending, you know, a half a year on a painting. That is not cost effective if you want to be in business. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. And I did really not leverage. even take accounting. <laughs> some, you would have to really leverage that one painting. That's like. right. And some <laughs> so, people think it's like a, a brag and like they can brag about it where, oh, I spent months and months on this. And it's like. Why? Yeah. Why? Wow. You did? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. I think no. <laughs> it, you should strive to the point where your skills are so amazing that you can produce so much work in a short period of time that's high quality. Well, like think that's, about that's it. where I want to be is mm-hmm. you can produce high quality work in a short period of time and it's still worth a lot because you've put the time in to, to learn develop how those to do skills. That. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Your time doesn't equal money. Like, you know, it's the it's the t- all the time that you put in, I just said time again, but all the <laughs> energy and effort that you put into learning it that is valuable. It's not yeah. the amount of time. Like if you could you could create a painting in 30 minutes and it would be worth more than um one of the paintings maybe that you made in 12 hours because the painting is just perceived as a higher value because it's more beautiful. Yeah. And, and, you know, it goes back to the first point of mindset. Mm -hmm. If you want to own an art business and you want to be the CEO of your own multi-international art business, and you want to be in business and consistently sell art, you have to treat it like a business, just like any other business. Imagine opening a restaurant and I'm like, Jake, Dimitra, guess what? I'm going to open a restaurant. Cool. Okay, imagine if I did that, but I never bought food. I never ate out at a restaurant. I never learned to cook. I didn't know anybody. I didn't develop any kind of team strategy on how to build rapport with employees and get the most out of them. I didn't create a system. I didn't buy tables and chairs. I didn't research anything. I didn't look at my market. I didn't do, you think I'm going to be successful? No. I would have to eat out at a lot of restaurants, identify what kind of restaurant I want, look at the market, find a location, talk to lots of realtors, get a community together, get a menu together, get the right people on the team. You think that happens overnight or in two weeks? That would take at least six months at the soonest. Mm -hmm. You don't just go and open a restaurant. You do all kinds of preparation. And that's how you even begin to get on the board. And then once you open, that's when the real work starts. And do you think you do it 10 hours a week? Do you spend 10 hours a week opening a restaurant or doing the market research for it or getting prepared to have that and investing your life into that? Does it, does it, no, it is a full-time position. It takes every ounce. And a lot of people open restaurants while they still have their job, right? Mm -hmm. And they're transferring out of their job into the restaurant. And you talk to those people that today have a super successful restaurant or chain of restaurants. You're like, how did you begin? They're like, well, I was in this job and I worked every waking hour 
every waking hour, I was working on my restaurant and I spent six months doing all this research and I developed menus and I worked with this and I got this guy on my team and I went to this thing and I went to that thing. All the while, I kept this full-time job and I got this investor and I, t I told my story and I communicated and I learned this skill and I learned that skill. I read this book. I did this. I did that. And then I finally launched and I quit my, I was able to quit my job. And then I worked 90 hours a week on my restaurant from the moment I woke up till I went to bed for at least a solid year. You talk about work. That is some crazy work. So yeah, 30 paintings is a bare minimum. If you aren't even interested or that scares you away, don't be an artist. Don't be an artist. Why are you want to be an artist if you don't want to paint? Yeah. Exactly. I it's not for everyone, a professional career as an artist. Like it's just, it's not for everyone or even every artist. I don't, I don't think like it's for the people who really love it that much and want to do it full time. And they want to paint all the time and they love to paint and that's yeah. their happy place. Yeah. And if you do love it that much, then you have to be willing, if you want it to be full time, you have to be willing to put in the work. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, it's a lot more work. It's a yeah. lot. It's like building the inertia. It's a lot that harder to get started. True. But then once you like already open one restaurant, then having chains, I assuming getting more like is easier. For yeah, sure. it's easier. You're building momentum and you already have the process down for one. So um, getting on the board yeah, and your first few part. sales are the hardest. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. The more that I grow older and get wiser, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the more that I realize, you know, it's about short-term pain for long-term, um, I don't want to say pleasure, but I want to say gain. fulfillment. Yeah. Or gain. Yeah. Long-term gain or fulfillment. Cause then it rhymes. Yeah. Pain and gain. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. That's what my stepdad used to say all the time. Actually, when we were picking weeds, he'd be like, no pain, no gain <laughs> all yeah. the time. Every single yeah. time we complain. Uh, we complain. He said, no, no That's pain, no gain. That's what the workout lady said this morning <laughs> in my booty workout. No pain, no gain. Yep. <laughs> That's right. So you got to be willing to endure some short-term pain in order to get that long-term gain. That's so, right. Um, okay. So we're on. Now we're moving on to step five. So step five <laughs> is uh, to market and sell your work. So... That's the fun part. We kind of just covered it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so. Everything we're saying is market and sell. You yeah. Like. Yeah. So developing your brand is a part of marketing, really. But, you know, if you wanted to lay out marketing simply, it's just three steps. It's, uh, and we just talked about this earlier, it's finding leads, converting those leads, and getting those people to buy again. It's really that simple. And there are a um, hundred and one different ways to find new leads. Um, I would say there are a little bit less ways to convert those leads. Like it gets a little bit more simple and straightforward as you kind of work your way down those steps. Um, but really it's, it's all about the fundamentals and the basics. Like the more that I get into marketing, the more that I learn that it's about having, having uh, a super airtight fundamental strategy behind your marketing. Um, and that goes with your positioning you know, as, as a, as a, a thought leader or whatever, um, as a brand, you know, using your story, using your unfair advantages, using your process, you know, your artwork, obviously it's like leveraging that, creating a position, um, within a market. Right. And, and then doing simple tactics like posting on social media and well, the giant elusive, um, unicorn is how do I market and sell my artwork? Mm hmm so, you know, for step five, market and sell your artwork, it's just like everything else in this podcast. Yeah. There's the entry point where market and sell your artwork could literally mean um, you created a, a title for that piece. You created a blurb that communicates what you meant to say for that piece. You created a title card to put next to that piece and you put it up at a tent show on the wall and then you got square on your phone and you made the transaction when somebody came in the booth and you communicated well the story and then you got their email so that you can sell to them later. That could be market and sell exactly. your artwork. Exactly. That's honestly and the then, best place to start, really. Yeah. That is. And then it can go from there into lots of really cool, complex things. You could build this funnel there and that funnel there and you could have this thing going on 
you know, this yeah. platform and that platform. And it all can begin to build your huge business and your empire. And it's exciting that art has this type of growth and challenge associated with it. And that there's so far you can go with marketing. It's not a silver bullet. It's not just a one thing. It is just starting somewhere really simply. And I would say the baseline for all of it, whether you're going really far in marketing to the complex things or just starting at the tent show, the main thing is communication. You're just communicating what it is you have to the other person. And there's so many forms of communication and that that communication, that story, that those words, that picture, that video, the post, whatever, the ad, however you communicate it is just there to get those leads, to get the interest up, to get those people sort of um, in your court, in your um in your view. And, and now they're, you know, your people, they're on your email list, they're your audience on social media, they're, you know, the people that you communicate regularly and they'll eventually convert. So I think that, you know, people overcomplicate marketing and selling. It's this daunting, scary thing. You're totally right. And, and artists say all the time, I just want to paint. I hate marketing. And it's like, marketing's fun. Don't you think marketing's fun? It's so creative. It's just like your art. It can be as deep and powerful and life-changing and culture shifting as your art, Mm -hmm. honestly. And some people think just promoting something once and they're like, oh, I didn't get any sales or I don't know if anyone saw this. You have to promote it so many times before someone, it has to be like in their mind and then they see these ads over and over. Well, not even ads though. You just have like- Not just ads, but posting. I mean, putting it on your website, like the more you the talk about it, the more it's going to be on people's minds. They're mm-hmm. like, all right, I'm going to buy something because they see it like seven times. And yeah. A, that's all they can think about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I love that you simplified it though, because really what I was talking about is how to like the basics of having an online marketing strategy, but there's also the in-person marketing strategy. And that's the most simple place to get started. And honestly, I would say it's the best place to get started too, because you get immediate feedback from the people and interaction with them and you can make adjustments way quicker. And it's so easy to know or it's so much easier to know at least what went wrong in person than what went wrong with your online digital marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there can be a lot of different ways that you can optimize and improve and, you know, tweak and make all these, you know, research and make all these little changes and stuff to your digital marketing strategy. But when it comes down to it, you don't need that in the beginning, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't need that. Uh, You can get up to $10,000 a month or more just doing your, the tent shows, like you're saying. And a lot of artists do that. They find that that works for them and they just stick to that. And then yeah. that's plenty. You, you know? just got to show your work. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a book, Austin Kleon, of, um, that's called Show Your Work. Mm-hmm. And it's a super fast read. You could probably read it in a couple hours. And it's basically an essay spread out over like a hundred pages of a mini book. That's a lot of books these days. Have you noticed? Yeah. He, he did a great job at like, you know, monetizing selling. Monetizing thoughts. For artists. Yeah. Monetizing <laughs> thoughts and with very, very little, um, words, uh, words. Yeah. Yes. Gone into it, but packaging it. He yeah, packaged, packaged it, it really yeah. well. Anyway, it's a really great book. And when I say book, don't, don't not get it. Cause you think it's a book. Like think of it as an essay. Um, it's a picture book, really. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a, a children's book. book almost, but for adults. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's for artists. That's what we need. Yeah. And it's called <laughs> Show Your Work. No, change the identity. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's called Show Your Work. And basically, if you want to skip reading the book, here's the book. Show Your Work. That's it. <laughs> there yeah. you go. It was all in the title. Yeah, it's all in the title. So you, it's just get it out there anyway, anyhow. Don't try to be perfect. And that that like really is marketing and you'll learn, you'll learn so much. And then meanwhile, don't forget all the other things we said. You know, read books, educate yourself, talk to people, you know, pick up skills. It's an ongoing process. But just to get on the board and to get started, you just want to show your work everywhere you can, every which way, all the time. Mm-hmm. There show you go. your work, show your work. Step number five, check. Um, okay, so number six. Now, this is when it starts to get a little bit more into the business side, but really this can be simple too. And it's just building out the systems of your business. And all that is, is like if you have to come up with 
every single time you do a tent show, you have to try to think about all the little details um, and then you might forget stuff. But mm -hmm. if you just simply write out a checklist, okay, every, tr every tent show I need to have uh, 10 paintings signed, varnished with wire on the back. All the sides are painted. Okay, that's my checklist for paintings, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I have uh, my little folding divider that goes up. Make sure I have that, check. Uh, make sure I have um, business cards to hand out, check. Make sure I have my little sign, um, you know, with my signature on it or yeah. however, you know, Or a check. method. What is my system and method on collecting email addresses? Yes. Uh, what is my system and method on, you know, asking for the sale? Uh, and, and actually going through the process of selling a piece of artwork. Um, you know, thinking of those systems and perfecting them every time you do them will translate, because if you do great at the small, in the, in the days of small things, then when it does grow, you'll already be conditioned and programmed to be a systems person so that when you are putting on a, a big show or you're running a really complex digital, um, you know, marketing uh, strategy plan uh, and, you, and you're putting money behind it and you're investing in it, you already know what is going to work because you're a systems person and you know, uh, you have your checklist, you have your spreadsheets and, and you can refer to them and duplicate your efforts and, and do it again next show, next time and get a template down. It's all about getting that template, mm -hmm. a successful template. And then you're building value over time. You're not just having one sort of existential experience after another that never... <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good description. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, that never, you know, uh, culminates into an actual business. Mm -hmm. That's a really great thing is, is a system on whatever level you're at. Yeah, 100%. Um, and it makes it easier for when you do decide to scale, scary word uh, for some people, scale your business uh, and hire other people. You know, yeah. you have these templates, you have, you don't have to like spend all this time, you know, trying to train these people awkwardly, you know, looking like you don't actually know what you're doing because you forgot because you didn't ever yeah. write anything if down. If you hire an event manager, you hand them your spreadsheets exactly. and they know exactly what to do and what mm -hmm. not to do. hundred percent. So that is, you know. Bringing your business to the next level, really, it's not essential in the beginning. Like one to three thousand uh, dollars a month, you don't need that in order to be super successful. But you want to get past that. You want to make your life easier. You invest the time in the beginning um, when you, or as you're learning um, into making these systems. Well, and, and it's writing how it you down. can get a, a tent show where you made fifteen hundred dollars to the point where you make forty five hundred dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, and because you're, you're perfecting your methods. Yep, exactly. And the last one um, is really probably one of the most important things, um, and that is to have fun with the process. <laughs> Step number seven. Uh, it is creating art. It is, you know... And art and business is art, really, if you think about it. Like it is a, it is, it is a creative expression Definitely. of yourself. And because your business isn't just, you know, a, a, a way for you to transact and make money from people. It's uh, the, the, at the core of every single business, it's to provide value for another human being. And you're doing that through your art. The, what makes business fun is finding out all the different ways that you can provide additional value to that person and making an even better experience for them. You know, that should be fun. And if it's not fun, then um, get a job. No, <laughs> just kidding. no, it's a fantastic point. I want to, I want to speak to that. Yeah. If it is not fun, figure out why. Yeah, no, because it's that's true. Not figure out why first. <laughs> don't just go, this isn't fun. I should do something else. Yeah, because no, it's, it's going to be tough. <laughs> yeah, it the, should be fun. Then you know you're fun. doing it right. It will be fun after some time. In the beginning, you will toil. Like, I mean, yeah. at least if you're like uh, like us or like most people who start businesses, you're going to toil. Well, but. and I think it's great to like take some time to assess and go, okay, why is this not fun? What mm -hmm. do I not like about this? What hurts so bad? What what am I dreading? Where do where do I have dread when I think of the future or that next show I'm doing or that what do I not like? And it could it could be touching on like deeper issues like rejection and like you're just so afraid and so nervous that when you go to that show nobody's going to like your work and that's going to spring up rejection in you or it could there could be so many different reasons why it's not fun and most of them are self-inflicted mm -hmm. and I know this because I've been a pro at that so 
most of the time it's a mind shift and you decide to have fun. Yeah. And, and um, I heard uh, Brie, she posted something that was really good on... Um, Brie she Fitzpatrick? Did, yeah, or, on yeah. the... Uh, she just did a show in Miami. And she, she basically said that she went into it with zero expectations for sales. She wanted to approach the whole thing as an experience and fun. And she's, she gets to bring her art to this place. She's going to meet all these people. And if she sells something wonderful, you know, and I think that I would tweak that a bit myself and I would, I would have all those attitudes and then aim to sell also. Um, and, and really like focus on that, but hold it loosely. And if it doesn't happen, still enjoy all the other parts of it because it's experience and there's always a next time. So I think fun is, is deeply related to the next time. If this is your one shot and it's, and it's going to convince you whether you should keep going or not, and you have all this pressure about it, it's not going to be fun. And you're not going to be happy with the results, no matter yeah. what they are. And you'll be so stressed out. Nobody will want to buy your art yeah. because they'll be like, look, this lady over here tearing out her hair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and I've done that sweating. so many times. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've been, I've done that to myself so many times, yeah. you know, where I've put way too much pressure and expectations and, and forgot about it's fun. It's, it's an, it's a wild adventure. It's a mm-hmm. wonderful experience. Yeah. It's so true. And I'm fulfilling. glad you, I'm glad you completely, uh, contradicted what I said, cause it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Don't just go get a job <laughs> first. Find out why it's not fun. Cause everyone should be a business owner. Yeah. At I, some point, at least, you know, I think it'll, the world would be a much better place if we mm-hmm. had less big tech corporation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Don't censor this. Um, <laughs> okay. And if you've watched all the way to the end, then congratulations. You're a, you're a business owner. You're in the top 20%. <laughs> uh, and you clearly uh, should pursue your passion for art. Because if you watch us all the way till the end, then chances are it's not because we're wildly entertaining. It's because you're so fascinated with this information, even though we might be wildly entertaining. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. I would say if you're if you're still in it at this point, you, your destiny is to be a super successful artist, Yeah. period, end of story. Mm-hmm. I don't even have to know you. And, and the good news is, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, it's seven steps. It might seem kind, kind of daunting, or maybe it even seems simple to you and you're ready to go, you know, you're ready to click out of this and go start your career or start pursuing it. But the beautiful thing about all these steps is we've actually already done all the hard work. Well, these two have, I've just, I kind of took the course, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> we have done all the work and put together a duplicatable system for you to follow as an artist. So you don't have to figure out all of the, and make all the mistakes yourself. You can um, shorten that window of time and not have to look back in retrospect and learn from all these different mistakes. You can take, you know, from the years of experience of mistakes that these two have made, uh, which translated into success and um, learn from that. And you can become a professional artist in just one year. If you actually apply these steps, you go through the full system that we've created for you uh, and you take the mastery program. So the one year program that we're talking about is the online mastery program. Any artist can take it um, and there's no application. Uh, it's open to everyone. Um, you don't have to have prior experience. You don't have to have gone to an art school or uh, even know how to draw a fly. Uh, anyone, as we've said, can At learn. any age. And you don't have to be a young sprite or uh, a mature person with years of experience. You, We've had people who are as young as 14 years old take this course. And we've had ladies as old as, you know, 82 years old take the course. So, um, and if you're older than that, let us know because we want to get your testimonial uh, after you take the program and start selling your artwork professionally. If you want to learn more about this, just go to www.masteryprogram.com or you can go to milanarinstitute.com and read more about Milanar Institute. And, you know, we have a bunch of other videos on this channel as well, but that is how you turn your passion for art um, or turn your art into a successful business. You follow these steps. You don't even need to take the mastery program. Um, you can you know, do all of this without taking it. The mastery program is just sort of um, the, shortcut. the shortcut. You know, uh, it's, it's not a shortcut because you still have to put in the work. 
Uh, it's not a shortcut to the results, but it is a shortcut for the learning curve. You can shorten your learning curve by taking the mastery program and save you years of time. Uh, so I hope that you enjoyed this podcast. If you're still listening now or watching now, then you are a champion. And as Ellie said bef before, you are destined to be a professional artist. So thank you and tune in next Friday for the next Light Movement Podcast episode. So if you enjoyed this episode of the Light Movement Podcast, we have this other super amazing episode that we want to share with you. Uh, we talk all about how to get into a gallery, um, but if you're thinking about becoming a professional artist, then don't watch it, go pursue your passion. And But otherwise, if you're still on the fence, then watch this video about you know getting into a gallery.